Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. Tuesdays with Mori. An Old Man, A Young Man, and Life's Greatest Lesson. By Mitch Album. The 13th Tuesday we talk about the perfect day Mori wanted to be cremated. He had discussed it with Charlotte, and they decided it was the best way. The rabbi from Brandeis, Alex Selrede, a longtime friend whom they chose to conduct the funeral service had come to visit Mori, and Mori told him of his cremation plans. And Al? Yes? Make sure they don't overcook me. The rabbi was stunned. But Mori was able to joke about his body now. The closer he got to the end, the more he saw it as a mere shell, a container of the soul. It was withering to useless skin and bones anyhow, which made it easier to let go. We are so afraid of the sight of death, Mori told me when I sat down. I adjusted the microphone on his collar, but it kept flopping over. Mori coughed. He was coughing all the time now. I read a book the other day. It said as soon as someone dies in a hospital, they pull the sheets up over their head, and they will the body to some shoot and push it down. They can't wait to get it out of their sight. People act as if death is contagious. I fumbled with the microphone. Mori glanced at my hands. It's not contagious, you know. Death is as natural as life. It's part of the deal we made. He coughed again, and I moved back and waited, always braced for something serious. Mori had been having bad nights lately. Frightening nights. He could sleep only a few hours at a time before violent hacking spells woke him. The nurses would come into the bedroom, pound him on the back, try to bring up the poison. Even if they got him breathing normally again dash, normally, meaning with the help of the oxygen machine the fight left him fatigued the whole next day. The oxygen tube was up his nose now. I hated the sight of it. To me, it symbolized helplessness. I wanted to pull it out. Last night. Maury said softly. Yes? Last night? I had a terrible spell. It went on for hours. And I really wasn't sure I was going to make it. No breath. No end to the choking. At one point, I started to get dizzy. And then I felt a certain peace, I felt that I was ready to go. His eyes widened. Mitch, it was a most incredible feeling. The sensation of accepting what was happening, being at peace. I was thinking about a dream I had last week, where I was crossing a bridge into something unknown. Being ready to move on to whatever is next. But you didn't. Mori waited a moment. He shook his head slightly. No, I didn't. But I felt that I could. Do you understand? That's what we're all looking for. A certain peace with the idea of dying. If we know, in the end, that we can ultimately have that peace with dying, then we can finally do the really hard thing. Which is. Make peace with living. He asked to see the hibiscus plant on the ledge behind him. I cupped it in my hand and held it up near his eyes. He smiled. It's natural to die, he said again. The fact that we make such a big hullabaloo over it is all because we don't see ourselves as part of nature. We think because we're human we're something above nature. He smiled at the plant. We're not. Everything that gets born, dies. He looked at me. Do you accept that? Yes. All right, he whispered, now here's the payoff. Here is how we are different from these wonderful plants and animals. As long as we can love each other, and remember the feeling of love we had, we can die without ever really going away. All the love you created is still there. All the memories are still there. You live on in the hearts of everyone you have touched and nurtured while you were here. His voice was raspy, which usually meant he needed to stop for a while. I placed the plant back on the ledge and went to shut off the tape recorder. 
This is the last sentence Mori got out before I did, death ends a life, not a relationship. There had been a development in the treatment of ALS, an experimental drug that was just gaining passage. It was not a cure, but a delay, a slowing of the decay for perhaps a few months. Mori had heard about it, but he was too far gone. Besides, the medicine wouldn't be available for several months. Not for me, Mori said, dismissing it. In all the time he was sick, Mori never held out hope he would be cured. He was realistic to a fault. One time, I asked if someone were to wave a magic wand and make him all better, would he become, in time, the man he had been before? He shook his head. No way I could go back. I am a different self now. I'm different in my attitudes. I'm different appreciating my body, which I didn't do fully before. I'm different in terms of trying to grapple with the big questions, the ultimate questions, the ones that won't go away. That's the thing, you see. Once you get your fingers on the important questions, you can't turn away from them. And which are the important questions? As I see it, they have to do with love, responsibility, spirituality, awareness. And if I were healthy today, those would still be my issues. They should have been all along. I tried to imagine Mori healthy. I tried to imagine him pulling the covers from his body, stepping from that chair, the two of us going for a walk around the neighborhood, the way we used to walk around campus. I suddenly realized it had been 16 years since I'd seen him standing up. 16 years? What if you had one day perfectly healthy, I asked. What would you do? 24 hours? 24 hours. Let's see. I'd get up in the morning, do my exercises, have a lovely breakfast of sweet rolls and tea, go for a swim, then have my friends come over for a nice lunch. I'd have them come one or two at a time so we could talk about their families, their issues, talk about how much we mean to each other. Then I'd like to go for a walk, in a garden with some trees, watch their colors, watch the birds, take in the nature that I haven't seen in so long now. In the evening, we'd all go together to a restaurant with some great pasta, maybe some duck I love duck and then we'd dance the rest of the night. I'd dance with all the wonderful dance partners out there, until I was exhausted. And then I'd go home and have a deep, wonderful sleep. That's it? That's it. It was so simple. So average. I was actually a little disappointed. I figured he'd fly to Italy or have lunch with the president or romp on the seashore or try every exotic thing he could think of. After all these months, lying there, unable to move a leg or a foot how could he find perfection in such an average day? Then I realized this was the whole point. Before I left that day, Mori asked if he could bring up a topic. Your brother, he said. I felt a shiver. I do not know how Mori knew this was on my mind. I had been trying to call my brother in Spain for weeks, and had learned from a friend of his that he was flying back and forth to a hospital in Amsterdam. Mitch, I know it hurts when you can't be with someone you love. But you need to be at peace with his desires. Maybe he doesn't want you interrupting your life. Maybe he can't deal with that burden. I tell everyone I know to carry on with the life they know don't ruin it because I am dying. But he's my brother, I said. I know, Maury said. That's why it hurts. I saw Peter in my mind when he was eight years old, his curly blonde hair puffed into a sweaty ball atop his head. I saw us wrestling in the yard next to our house, the grass stains soaking through the knees of our jeans. I saw him singing songs in front of the mirror, holding a brush as a microphone, and I saw us squeezing into the attic where we hid together as children, testing our parents' will to find us for dinner. And then I saw him as the adult who had drifted away, thin and frail, his face bony from the chemotherapy treatments. Maury, I said. Why doesn't he want to see me? My old professor sighed. There is no formula to relationships. They have to be negotiated in loving ways, with room for both parties, what they want and what they need, 
what they can do and what their life is like. In business, people negotiate to win. They negotiate to get what they want. Maybe you're too used to that. Love is different. Love is when you are as concerned about someone else's situation as you are about your own. You've had these special times with your brother, and you no longer have what you had with him. You want them back. You never want them to stop. But that's part of being human. Stop, renew, stop, renew. I looked at him. I saw all the death in the world. I felt helpless. You'll find a way back to your brother, Maury said. How do you know? Maury smiled. You found me, didn't you? I heard a nice little story the other day, Maury says. He closes his eyes for a moment and I wait. Okay. The story is about a little wave, bobbing along in the ocean, having a grand old time. He's enjoying the wind and the fresh air until he notices the other waves in front of him, crashing against the shore. My God, this is terrible, the wave says. Look what's going to happen to me. Then along comes another wave. It sees the first wave, looking grim, and it says to him, Why do you look so sad? The first wave says, You don't understand. We're all going to crash. All of us waves are going to be nothing. Isn't it terrible? The second wave says, No, you don't understand. You're not a wave, you're part of the ocean. I smile. Mori closes his eyes again. Part of the ocean, he says, part of the ocean. I watch him breathe, in and out, in and out. The fourteenth Tuesday we say goodbye it was cold and damp as I walked up the steps to Mori's house. I took in little details, things I hadn't noticed for all the times I'd visited. The cut of the hill. The stone facade of the house. The pachysandra plants, the low shrubs. I walked slowly, taking my time, stepping on dead wet leaves that flattened beneath my feet. Charlotte had called the day before to tell me Maury was not doing well. This was her way of saying the final days had arrived. Maury had cancelled all of his appointments and had been sleeping much of the time, which was unlike him. He never cared for sleeping, not when there were people he could talk with. He wants you to come visit, Charlotte said, but, Mitch. Yes? He's very weak. The porch steps. The glass in the front door. I absorbed these things in a slow, observant manner, as if seeing them for the first time. I felt the tape recorder in the bag on my shoulder, and I unzipped it to make sure I had tapes. I don't know why. I always had tapes. Connie answered the bell. Normally buoyant, she had a drawn look on her face. Her hello was softly spoken. How's he doing? I said. Not so good. She bit her lower lip. I don't like to think about it. He's such a sweet man, you know? I knew. This is such a shame. Charlotte came down the hall and hugged me. She said that Maury was still sleeping, even though it was 10 a.m. We went into the kitchen. I helped her straighten up, noticing all the bottles of pills, lined up on the table, a small army of brown plastic soldiers with white caps. My old professor was taking morphine now to ease his breathing. I put the food I had brought with me into the refrigerator soup, vegetable cakes, tuna salad. I apologized to Charlotte for bringing it. Maury hadn't chewed food like this in months, we both knew that, but it had become a small tradition. Sometimes, when you're losing someone, you hang on to whatever tradition you can. I waited in the living room, where Maury and Ted Koppel had done their first interview. I read the newspaper that was lying on the table. Two Minnesota children had shot each other playing with their father's guns. A baby had been found buried in a garbage can in an alley in Los Angeles. I put down the paper and stared into the empty fireplace. I tapped my shoe lightly on the hardwood floor. Eventually, I heard a door open and close, then Charlotte's footsteps coming toward me. 
All right, she said softly. He's ready for you. I rose and I turned toward our familiar spot, then saw a strange woman sitting at the end of the hall in a folding chair, her eyes on a book, her legs crossed. This was a hospice nurse, part of the 24-hour watch. Maury's study was empty. I was confused. Then I turned back hesitantly to the bedroom, and there he was, lying in bed, under the sheet. I had seen him like this only one other time when he was getting massaged and the echo of his aphorism, when you're in bed, you're dead, began anew inside my head. I entered, pushing a smile onto my face. He wore a yellow pajama-like top, and a blanket covered him from the chest down. The lump of his form was so withered that I almost thought there was something missing. He was as small as a child. Maury's mouth was open, and his skin was pale and tight against his cheekbones. When his eyes rolled toward me, he tried to speak, but I heard only a soft grunt. There he is, I said, mustering all the excitement I could find in my empty till. He exhaled, shut his eyes, then smiled, the very effort seeming to tire him. My dear friend, he finally said. I am your friend, I said. I'm not so good today. Tomorrow will be better. He pushed out another breath and forced a nod. He was struggling with something beneath the sheets, and I realized he was trying to move his hands toward the opening. Hold, he said. I pulled the covers down and grasped his fingers. They disappeared inside my own. I leaned in close, a few inches from his face. It was the first time I had seen him unshaven, the small white whiskers looking so out of place, as if someone had shaken salt neatly across his cheeks and chin. How could there be new life in his beard when it was draining everywhere else? Maury, I said softly. Coach, he corrected. Coach, I said. I felt a shiver. He spoke in short bursts, inhaling air, exhaling words. His voice was thin and raspy. He smelled of ointment. You, are a good soul. A good soul. Touched me, he whispered. He moved my hands to his heart. Here. It felt as if I had a pit in my throat. Coach? Ah? Uh, I don't know how to say goodbye. He patted my hand weakly, keeping it on his chest. This is how we say goodbye. He breathed softly, in and out, I could feel his ribcage rise and fall. Then he looked right at me. Love, you, he rasped. I love you, too, coach. No you do, no, something else. What else do you know? You always have. His eyes got small, and then he cried, his face contorting like a baby who hasn't figured how his tear ducts work. I held him close for several minutes. I rubbed his loose skin. I stroked his hair. I put a palm against his face and felt the bones close to the flesh and the tiny wet tears, as if squeezed from a dropper. When his breathing approached normal again, I cleared my throat and said I knew he was tired, so I would be back next Tuesday and I expected him to be a little more alert, thank you. He snorted lightly, as close as he could come to a laugh. It was a sad sound just the same. I picked up the unopened bag with the tape recorder. Why had I even brought this? I knew we would never use it. I leaned in and kissed him closely, my face against his, whiskers on whiskers, skin on skin, holding it there, longer than normal in case it gave him even a split second of pleasure. Okay, then? I said, pulling away. I blinked back the tears, and he smacked his lips together and raised his eyebrows at the sight of my face. I like to think it was a fleeting moment of satisfaction for my dear old professor, he had finally made me cry. Okay, then, he whispered. Graduation. Maury died on a Saturday morning. His immediate family was with him in the house. Rob made it in from Tokyo he got to kiss his father goodbye and John was there, and of course Charlotte was there and Charlotte's cousin Marcia, 
who had written the poem that so moved Mori at his unofficial memorial service, the poem that likened him to a tender sequoia. They slept in shifts around his bed. Mori had fallen into a coma two days after our final visit, and the doctor said he could go at any moment. Instead, he hung on, through a tough afternoon, through a dark night. Finally, on the 4th of November, when those he loved had left the room just for a moment to grab coffee in the kitchen, the first time none of them were with him since the coma began Mori stopped breathing. And he was gone. I believe he died this way on purpose. I believe he wanted no chilling moments, no one to witness his last breath and be haunted by it, the way he had been haunted by his mother's death notice telegram or by his father's corpse in the city morgue. I believe he knew that he was in his own bed, that his books and his notes and his small hibiscus plant were nearby. He wanted to go serenely, and that is how he went. The funeral was held on a damp, windy morning. The grass was wet and the sky was the color of milk. We stood by the hole in the earth, close enough to hear the pond water lapping against the edge and to see ducks shaking off their feathers. Although hundreds of people had wanted to attend, Charlotte kept this gathering small, just a few close friends and relatives. Rabbi Axelrod read a few poems. Maury's brother, David who still walked with a limp from his childhood polio lifted the shovel and tossed dirt in the grave, as per tradition. At one point, when Maury's ashes were placed into the ground, I glanced around the cemetery. Maury was right. It was indeed a lovely spot, trees and grass and a sloping hill. You talk, I'll listen, he had said. I tried doing that in my head and, to my happiness, found that the imagined conversation felt almost natural. I looked down at my hands, saw my watch and realized why. It was Tuesday. My father moved through Thays of Wee, singing each new leaf out of each tree, and every child was sure that spring danced when she heard my father sing. Poem by E. E. Cummings, read by Maury S. Sun, R.O.B., at the memorial service conclusion. I look back sometimes at the person I was before I rediscovered my old professor. I want to talk to that person. I want to tell him what to look out for, what mistakes to avoid. I want to tell him to be more open, to ignore the lure of advertised values, to pay attention when your loved ones are speaking, as if it were the last time you might hear them. Mostly I want to tell that person to get on an airplane and visit a gentle old man in West Newton, Massachusetts, sooner rather than later, before that old man gets sick and loses his ability to dance. I know I cannot do this. None of us can undo what we've done, or relive a life already recorded. But if Professor Morris Schwartz taught me anything at all, it was this, there is no such thing as, too late, in life. He was changing until the day he said goodbye. Not long after Maury's death, I reached my brother in Spain. We had a long talk. I told him I respected his distance, and that all I wanted was to be in touch in the present, not just the past to hold him in my life as much as he could let me. You're my only brother, I said. I don't want to lose you. I love you. I had never said such a thing to him before. A few days later, I received a message on my fax machine. It was typed in the sprawling, poorly punctuated, all-cap letters fashion that always characterized my brother's words. H.I. I've joined the 90s, it began. He wrote a few little stories, what he'd been doing that week, a couple of jokes. At the end, he signed off this way, I have heartburn and diarrhea at the moment life's a bitch. Chat later? Signed, Sore Tush. I laughed until there were tears in my eyes. This book was largely Maury's idea. He called it our final thesis. Like the best of work projects, it brought us closer together, and Maury was delighted when several publishers expressed interest, even though he died before meeting any of them. The advance money helped pay Maury's enormous medical bills, and for that we were both grateful. The title, by the way, we came up with one day in Maury's office. He liked naming things. He had several ideas. But when I said, how about Tuesdays with Maury, 
he smiled in an almost blushing way, and I knew that was it. After Maury died, I went through boxes of old college material. And I discovered a final paper I had written for one of his classes. It was twenty years old now. On the front page were my penciled comments scribbled to Maury, and beneath them were his comments scribbled back. Mine began, Dear Coach. His began, Dear Player. For some reason, each time I read that, I miss him more. Have you ever really had a teacher? One who saw you as a raw but precious thing, a jewel that, with wisdom, could be polished to a proud shine? If you are lucky enough to find your way to such teachers, you will always find your way back. Sometimes it is only in your head. Sometimes it is right alongside their beds. The last class of my old professor's life took place once a week, in his home, by a window in his study where he could watch a small hibiscus plant shed its pink flowers. The class met on Tuesdays. No books were required. The subject was the meaning of life. It was taught from experience. The teaching goes on. The end. Thank you for being with us until the end. We hope you had a wonderful time. If you enjoyed our book, please support us by liking and leaving comments. We look forward to seeing you soon with another book. Best regards.